Thank you for um, coming along today to listen to this talk. I'm going to talk to you about um, one particular experiment um, that I've done over the last couple of years in collaboration with um, Masood Hussain's group. Some of you may know Masood. Um, and, um, and it's about looking at the eyes and what that might tell you about dopamine levels in the brain. So I'd like to start by just um, thanking everyone who took part in this study. Some of you may be present today. Um, Obviously, we couldn't have done it without you, so thank you very much. Okay, so you've heard about some of this already from, from George, so I don't need to dwell on this, but just, just to sort of reiterate some of the, some of the background, um, I'm sure you all know that dopamine, the decline of dopamine in the brain, which is shown by this red line here, um, is one of the cardinal features of Parkinson's disease, and that when you get diagnosed with Parkinson's on the basis of the movement disorder, that's shown in blue, um, already quite a lot of this decline has already happened. Um, and what we'd like to do is to be able to detect it earlier, um, up here, because of course then we have the best chance of sort of stopping it from, from deteriorating further. Um, <clears throat> but detecting it in this period is, is quite challenging. Um, there are, as you know, lots of symptoms that come out during this prodromal period, but most of them, things like losing your sense of smell, depression, um, constipation, things like that, really have nothing to do with dopamine. Um, so they're not very useful for, for looking at how much dopamine there is um, in the brain. And as George has mentioned, although you can directly measure the amount of dopamine in the brain with a, a DAT scan, some of you may be familiar with that, that's quite a specialized, expensive, involved test, and it's not really practical to do um, on any sort of large scale. So what we'd like to do is, is develop other methods of markers, of finding markers that will detect dopamine decline during this prodromal period. Um, so what, what can we look at? Well, of course, apart from the movement disorder, there is one other aspect of Parkinson's that is quite closely related um, to dopamine, um, and that's motivation. And we can see um, examples of this from the two extremes of motivation and how they're related to dopamine. So apathy um, is very common in Parkinson's disease and could be considered as a sort of pathological lack of motivation. And it's interesting to note that often apathy comes out when dopamine medications are reduced. And this sometimes happens in the context of deep brain stimulation. But when you withdraw dopamine, people often become more apathetic. And on the other end of the scale, impulsivity is also related to dopaminergic treatment. So I'm sure many of you will have heard of this story, this type of story before, that certain medications that stimulate dopamine um, can cause you to become overly motivated and develop addictions and impulsive behavior and so on. So there's quite a strong link between dopamine and motivation. Now, thinking about the mechanisms of motivation, so what is involved in motivation? There are two sort of main things that your brain has to consider if you want to be motivated to do something. One is what's on offer, how rewarding is this going to be? And the other is, What's it gonna cost me? How much effort do I have to put in to get that? And there's quite a lot of evidence that it's that first thing, which is evaluating the reward, which is particularly dependent on dopamine. And so what we wanted to do is look at ways of measuring that, measuring individuals' um, sensitivity to reward, how good they are at evaluating rewarding stimuli. Um, so how can we do that? Well, we could just ask people, we could look at their behavior, um, but Masood and his group have developed a slightly cleverer way um, of looking at this. And I'm going to um, illustrate this with an example of this um, very friendly looking cat. Um, it's actually not that friendly because it's just spider, a mouse, or something that the cat finds rewarding. Um, and I'm going to show you what happens to the cat when it sees the rewarding, juicy looking mouse. So have a look at the cat's eyes. As you can see, getting ready to pounce, the eyes dilate. So they start off small and they gradually dilate. And that is an automatic physiological response when you see something rewarding, is that your pupils dilate to get you ready for action. Okay, And it doesn't just happen in cats, it happens across all sorts of species, including humans. And crucially, the more rewarding the thing that you're looking at is the potential stimuli, the more your pupils dilate. Okay, 
Um, so you might walk past your news agent on a normal day and think, oh, I could play the lottery, but it's not really worth it. It's only two million pounds on offer. Um, or you could hear on the TV that there's a rollover and there's 150 million pounds on offer and you think, oh, brilliant, I'm going to go out and buy my ticket. Um, and probably for the second of those situations, your pupils will have dilated a little bit more and that will be part of your body's response to registering that rewarding, potentially rewarding stimulus. This is the task we've got. It's actually a pretty simple task. Um, all you have to do is look at this green dot in the middle of a computer screen and then after a cue which is the dot moving over to the right, you have to move your eyes to match where the dot has gone, okay? And basically, the better you perform this task, the better you move with the dot, the more you can win from this, this task. So this is, this is an experiment where you can actually win, win money, not 150 million, um, but a few pence per trial. Um, the crucial thing about this experiment is that before you do each trial, there is a voice which tells you the maximum amount of money that you can win for, each, for that particular trial. So just before you start, it will say 0 or 10p or 50p. And what we do is then measure the response of the pupil in response to that auditory cue telling you how much you can, you can win. And what you see, um, as shown in this graph, is that, so here is the pupils dilating, so the higher you go up here, the more they're dilating, and here is time after you've heard how much money's on offer. And you can see that the pupils dilate, um, and this is in blue, zero, in red, 10p, and in orange, 50p. And you can see that with the increasing levels of reward, your pupils dilate more. So this is a way that we can nicely measure how responsive you are to potential rewards. Okay, so I mentioned that we're interested in looking at this early prodromal um, phase, and the way that we've done that is by looking at patients with a condition called REM sleep behavior disorder, which many of you may be familiar with. People who develop REM sleep behavior disorder without Parkinson's, who just develop it on, on its own, have a very high chance of going on to get Parkinson's in future. But it's quite variable, so some of them will get PD soon, some of them it will take many, many years, even decades, and some of them might never get it at all. So what that means is that if you take a group of people who have got RBD, some of them will be up here, have pretty much normal levels of dopamine in their brain, and some of them will be down here with already quite a lot of decline of dopamine in their brain. So if we have a big group of these patients, we can look to see whether this is related to how sensitive they are to rewards using our task. So first of all, of course, in this situation, we have to actually measure how much dopamine is in people's brains. So we do that with a good old DAT scan. And you've seen some of these pictures already. Um, the interesting thing is that if you look at patients who have RBD, already almost half of them have scans that look a bit abnormal. Um, they don't look as abnormal as people who have got Parkinson's disease, but they do look different um, from control scans. Um, and about almost half of them have, have this, this, these early deficits, and really the defining feature of this is a reduction in the, in the amount of dopamine. And you can see that on this graph in the middle, that RBD patients who have got abnormal scans have got less dopamine in their brains than RBD patients who have got um, normal scans. And so we can use that, therefore, to look at these two, two different groups and compare them with their responses on our pupil reward task. Okay, and this is what we find. So this is just showing you the overall results. So what we've got here in blue is control participants, in red is patients with Parkinson's, and in green is patients with RBD. And up here you're seeing how much their pupils dilate, and here you're just seeing three different levels of reward. So zero, 10 pence, and 50 pence. And you can see how much the pupils dilate in response to those cues. And you can see that there isn't much going on when there's no reward on offer. When there's a bit of reward, the normal response is for the pupils to dilate, and then with the higher reward, to dilate even more. And you can see clearly here that patients with Parkinson's lose this response, so they're less sensitive to um, increasing levels of reward. 
And the patients with RBD, as you might expect since they're earlier in their disease course, fall somewhere in between. So they're not quite as sensitive as, as, as healthy control participants, um, but they're more sensitive than patients who have Parkinson's disease. And then the really interesting finding, when we split the RBD patients according to the amount of dopamine in their brain from the scans that I've just shown you, this is what we see. So now we still have healthy control participants in blue, and we still have Parkinson's patients in red. But this time, in green, we have RBD patients with normal levels of dopamine in their brain. And you can see that they respond to these cues exactly the same way as healthy control participants. On the other hand, RBD patients who have abnormal brain scans, who, who already have a reduction in the amount of dopamine in their brain, have lost this sensitivity to reward. So they now look more like patients who have Parkinson's disease. So this test, this test of measuring how much your pupils respond to rewarding stimuli seems to quite accurately describe how much dopamine you've got in your brain. Okay, so that, that's the end of the talk. Um, so just to summarize what I've said, I've shown you how if you lose dopamine in your brain, that can cause problems with processing of rewards, and that can in turn lead to clinical problems like apathy. I've shown you that we can measure how responsive you are to rewards by looking at how much your pupils dilate in response to varying levels of reward. I've shown you that people who have Parkinson's, their pupils don't respond in the same way, um, and they have what we would describe as blunted responses to rewards. People with RBD, who have a risk of getting Parkinson's, also have blunted rewards, reward sensitivity, but only if they've got a lack of dopamine in their brain. So therefore, measuring pupil responses in this way can give us a clue as to whether an individual has already started to have a decline in the amount of dopamine within their brain. And of course, as George has mentioned earlier, that may in future lead to being able to identify patients who have started on that downward trajectory who might be at most at, at, at potential benefit from new treatments that would slow down their progression. Thank you very much. So very interesting study results. Have we got any questions from the audience? And there's one at the back as well. Oh, we got three, right. Do you have any evidence about whether the variation in dopamine levels in the RBD patients is related to how close in time they are to their potential future progression to Parkinson's? Um, that, that's a, a very good question. Um, and of course, that is the ultimate question that, that we want to answer. Um, at the moment, no, we don't, because these experiments have been done um, quite recently. And overall, if you look at patients with RBD, about 6% per year will develop Parkinson's. So what that means is after you've done the experiment, it takes quite a long time, many years, before you can actually answer that question. Um, however, we know already from other experiments that have been done that if you've got a brain scan that shows you've got reduced levels of dopamine in your brain, um, you do have more risk of converting in the near term. And therefore, the fact that the eye signs that we've found match up with the brain scans suggests that that would be the case. Um, as, as George has mentioned, this is very, you know, this is unlikely to be a perfect test that will tell you on an individual basis, yes or no, whether you're going to get Parkinson's in the next year or two. But it may form part of um, an assessment that includes all sorts of different tests. Um, it may form one part of that. And as George has shown you, if you combine lots of individual tests that are quite good on their own, the combination of them all can be very good. Um, so uh, we hope it will, um, but only time will tell. So we'll have the gentleman at the back and then you next. Hi. Um, you said that early detection uh, was a good thing. I would not disagree with that. But I wonder what you could do to get the GPs to actually take the notice and, and uh, 
uh, go ahead with the investigation required. Um, I know many people have been to, to a GP who've uh, been poo pooed and turned away and, and told that it's their age or whatever. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's, um, it, you know, the, the so, so the, the, the question was, um, um, how can we improve um, that p initial point of contact between people when they're presenting with Parkinson's like symptoms to their GPs? And sometimes um, the GPs aren't able to say, identify the fact that this is Parkinson's and uh, the gentleman pointed out that in some cases that might mean that they're told it's nothing to do with Parkinson's it's just nothing um, and therefore it the, the diagnosis might get delayed and that is a, a really important problem and one that one that we all recognize um, and it's not because the GPs are useless it's because it's very very difficult and as you know Parkinson's comes on very gradually in many people and in the early stages of disease it can be very difficult to say definitely whether an individual does or doesn't have Parkinson's and that's why we're putting so much effort into trying to develop these tests and of course as as you point out if you're going to see your GP for a five-minute consultation the GP is not going to be able to just do a quick DAT scan to check so that's why a lot of the emphasis um, on our test is developing things that can be performed very quickly and very easily um, with widely available technology, um, things like smartphones and, and simple, simple tests. So you're right to identify that as a problem and it's something that we're, we're very aware of. Um, but at the, at the moment, that, that, that is a very difficult challenge. You need to get a GP to take notice to activate activate something. You need to get the GP to actually do something instead of saying no. Yeah, I mean, just to say also that we are training up GPs. I know that the local branch is also producing symptom leaflets as to what are the early non-motor features of Parkinson's, and we're training GPs in refresher courses, and I'm teaching um, and examining undergraduate neurology uh, exams for future doctors. So we're all slowly, slowly trying to give them this message of early, early symptoms. So I think we have one more question here um, before we hand over to our next speaker. Thank you. Uh, yes, you said that uh, people with RBD disorder are at high risk of developing Parkinson's. Are you able to put a percentage on that, of the number of people? Um, in the short term, yes. Um, so uh, as I mentioned earlier on, it's, it's very variable and sometimes it takes a very long time. So there, there have been reports of people who have developed RBD and then 20 years later or so have developed Parkinson's. Um, but there, we don't have very much evidence at that end of the scale. Um, so what we can say with, with, with confidence is that over the first few years after being diagnosed with RBD, the chance is about 6% per year, and that accumulates. Um, so we can say that after five years, the risk is about 30%. After 10 years, and we have pretty good data up to about 10 years, the risk is about 60%. Um, after that, the, the, the question of whether it continues um, to proceed at that same level of risk or whether it levels off, whether indeed there are a, a group of patients who may never get Parkinson's, is still somewhat uncertain. Um, but we have very good evidence now of the short-term risk, which is about 6% per year. People have been diagnosed with RBD but there's no saying how long they've had it before they've been diagnosed. I, I, exactly, yeah. Um, and we suspect that RBD is, is, is underdiagnosed um, for, for that reason. Um, and again, that's, that's something that you know, we, we strive for through our research is also to sort of I increase people's awareness of RBD um, because it, it, it is almost certainly much more common um, than we think. And again, um, diagnosing it is, is not straightforward. It requires quite specialist investigations. Um, 
so um, yes, that that is something that also you know we're very aware of, um, and indeed you know some of Christine's work um, is looking at ways that we can sort of improve the early diagnosis of of RBD for for exactly that reason. Thank you.